Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark, Mark Linnell, and I am with Salt Lake County Aging and Adult Services, the host agency for this year's Utah Elder Justice Conference. I want to welcome you to the Support for Alzheimer's and Dementia Caregivers session, which we are recording for later viewing. As an attendee of this session, you will only be able to see the presenter and yourself. All other attendees are hidden from your view. Um, you can click on the participants button in the lower right of the screen to see the panelists. Uh, please ask any questions you have uh, during the presentation through the Q&A, which is also located on the bottom right of your screen. I will now turn the time over to our presenter who will introduce themselves. Good morning. Um, I'm Raven Albertson. I'm the program director with the Utah chapter of the Alzheimer's Association. Um, coming to you from Orem, Utah, I have a background in public health as well as communications. I um, have spent several years working in public health in Utah County, specifically in women's health, tobacco prevention and cessation, um, and uh, uh, sorry, food security. And then I just kind of uh, really grown to love um, working with marginalized populations and fighting for equality and equity, um, especially t today. I think we'll look at um, how to make sure that services are available to everyone who needs them. Um, and I'll talk about our services. Uh, from the Alzheimer's Association that we offer and uh, give you lots of information on how you can access those and make referrals. Um, and also let's talk about why this is important um, on a public health level. Why, why is this a problem that we need to address? Um, caregiver health, basically. So let me share with you. the right one. <laughs> there we go. You ever use one computer for so long and you get used to how the buttons work? <laughs> So today we'll be talking about support for Alzheimer's and dementia caregivers. And anytime that you feel like you wanna share something, feel free. Um, this is an ongoing discussion. If you have something, please share it in the Q&A and uh, we'll try to get to you when there's a good uh, thought in the presentation. So thinking about just the basics, first of all, to make sure that you know what I'm talking about. Let's look at what is dementia. So a lot of people um, are unclear of what, you know, dementia actually is. So dementia is an overall term that describes symptoms associated with mental decline that's severe enough to interfere with daily life. Um, often a doctor will make a diagnosis of dementia when at least two of these core mental functions are impaired, memory, communication, and language, ability to focus and pay attention, uh, reasoning and judgment, and visual perception. Alzheimer's disease uh, was determined to be a progressive type of dementia that causes problems with memory, thinking, and behavior. Uh, one, myth, one myth that needs to be debunked is that everyone will get a touch of dementia or Alzheimer's um, just as a normal part of aging. That's really, um, not the case. The reality is that Alzheimer's is a disease. Um, and as such, it's not a normal part of aging. The most common form of dementia is Alzheimer's, and that accounts for up to 80% of dementia cases. Um, it's also progressively fatal. Um, it cannot currently be prevented, slowed, or cured. And so this 
disease in and of itself is a significant public health um, issue. And then we'll also get into the public health strain on caregivers as well. First, I want to make sure that you understand um, how Alzheimer's affects the brain and what happens to someone when they are um, going through the, the stages of the illness. So we'll watch a quick video um, that really explains that well. I could push the wrong button. <laughs> what is Alzheimer's disease? Alzheimer's is a slow, fatal disease of the brain affecting 1 in 10 people over the age of 65. No one is immune. The disease comes on gradually as two abnormal protein fragments called plaques and tangles accumulate in the brain and kill brain cells. They start here in the hippocampus, part of the brain where memories are first formed. Over many years' time, the plaques and tangles slowly destroy the hippocampus, and it becomes harder and harder to form new memories. Simple recollections from a few hours or days ago that the rest of us might take for granted are just not there. After that, more plaques and tangles spread into different regions of the brain, killing cells and compromising function wherever they go. This spreading around is what causes the different stages of Alzheimer's. From the hippocampus, the disease spreads here to the region of the brain where language is processed. When that happens, it gets tougher and tougher to find the right word. Next, the disease creeps toward the front of the brain, where logical thought takes place. Very gradually, a person begins to lose the ability to solve problems, grasp concepts, make plans. Next, the plaques and tangles invade the part of the brain where emotions are regulated. When this happens, the patient gradually loses control over moods and feelings. After that, the disease moves to where the brain makes sense of things it sees, hears, and smells. At this stage, Alzheimer's wreaks havoc on a person's senses and can spark hallucinations. Eventually, the plaques and tangles erase a person's oldest and most precious memories, which are stored here in the back of the brain. Near the end, these compromises a person's balance and coordination. The very last stage destroys the part of the brain that regulates breathing. Part. The progression from mild forgetting to death is slow and steady takes place over an average of 8 to 10 years. Senseless and, for now, incurable. Helping your family, friends, and neighbors to better understand Alzheimer's, reduce stigma, care, and even help the fight for a cure. Thanks for helping to do your part. Learn more at www.aboutalz.com. Okay, so maybe that's surprising to some of you. I know it was surprising to me to understand truly the stages of Alzheimer's and what's happening. Um, I think that a lot of people don't know, like we said, it's it's considered maybe, oh, this is just a normal part of aging when these, these cognitive decline activities begin to happen, but um, when you look at the stages, you can see that it's very distinct what is happening, um, and that's not a normal part of aging. And it's also very difficult um, for both the person who is going through those stages as well as those who are caring for them. So the Alzheimer's epidemic, um, at, at ages 65, one in 10 people will have Alzheimer's. Um, so you can see you can see that this becomes more and more as oops, as <laughs> sorry as um, age progresses. 
So at age 85, one in three people will have Alzheimer's disease. And two out of every three people with Alzheimer's are women. Um, so the, the burden of disease increases with age, which is not a normal part of aging. And it distinctly affects um, women more than men, um, not only because uh, those with Alzheimer's, more of them are women, but in addition to that, more caregivers are women as well. So it's a significant burden um, on women's health. And we're not exactly sure why um, women, more women um, develop Alzheimer's, but it is a startling truth. Um, when you think about the amount of hours that are put in and how the value of those hours, if someone, if it was paid care, um, that would be nearly $257 billion. Um, it's pretty significant. Um, and there's a lot of hours. If you look at the amount of hours that people are spending giving care, um, then you start to understand the burden on the caregiver as well. Um, so, as I mentioned, the, all, uh, the caregiver impact happens more to women as well because more women are caregivers. Um, in fact, 63% of caregiver, Alzheimer's caregivers are women. Um, we look at those caregivers who provide more than 40 hours per week. 73% of those are women. So dementia caregivers face special challenges and intensified care responsibilities compared to other types of caregivers. Um, they're regularly called upon to provide more assistance with activities of daily living, handling incontinence, helping with emotional or mental health problems, and helping with behavioral issues. The stress and strain associated with caring for someone with dementia is also higher than other caregivers. Alzheimer's caregivers report higher levels of stress and physical strain. They also anticipate care continuing for more than five years. If you remember the stages of Alzheimer's, they can last, um, the average is about eight years. So a very long period of caregiving. And because of this, they report worse personal health due to the care responsibilities. Uh, Sixty percent of Alzheimer's and dementia caregivers rate their emotional stress as high or very high, and 40 percent report symptoms of depression. And shockingly, 36 percent of caregivers actually die before the person they're caring for because they are not taking care of their personal health. And so you can see that it's very significant that we address the well-being um, of those who are providing care to those um, dealing with dementia. Uh, in addition to the impact on everyone's health, the financial impact is significant for caregivers um, because our well-being and our health care costs a lot, right? Um, in 2020, due to the physical and emotional toll of caregiving, Alzheimer's and dementia caregivers had over $12 billion in additional health care costs. So let's look at how this might be taking its toll on the Utah population. Um, there are more than 34,000 people in Utah living with Alzheimer's disease. This rep represents 10% of our senior population over the age of 65. Um, this number is expected to grow to over 42,000 by the year 2025, which would be a 23.5% increase from today in the number of people living with Alzheimer's disease. 
when you have more people living with the disease, you will require more caregivers. And if you remember the numbers, that would count to be about two people per um, individual dealing with the disease. During the pandemic in 2020, there were 374 more deaths from dementia than expected, mostly due to the challenges seen in assisted living communities. Of all the states in the nation, Utah is ranked number eight in the percentage of adults who are caregivers for people living with dementia. So we have a lot of caregivers in our state. And there are more than 104,000 caregivers who have given over 144 million hours of unpaid care. Um, if this care were paid for, it would cost about $2.4 billion. <laughs> Unfortunately, these caregivers are, are usually unpaid. So, to help combat these challenging statistics, our state adopted a state Alzheimer's plan in 2014 and has been working over the past six years to affect change. The state plan has four overarching goals. The first is to increase awareness about dementia throughout the state and to increase access to quality care. The second goal is to provide quality support and to empower family and other informal caregivers. The third goal is to work toward a fully dementia competent workforce in healthcare systems and throughout long-term care communities. And finally, to expand Alzheimer's research throughout the state, including offering more clinical trials for Utah residents to engage in. If you look at these four goals, you can actually see how all four of them would come together together to help support caregivers of, of those living with dementia. Um, increasing awareness in our state is, and especially among, amongst professionals who can create more interventions. Um, one of the biggest problems with the progression of the, the disease is that um, there's so much stigma, there's shame, Maybe they don't catch it early and early diagnosis is rare. And so if we're more aware, then we can connect people with the resources that are available and not only help them um, with the person who's living with the illness, but start beginning to support the caregiver early on. Um, and again, number two is supporting and empowering family and other informal, formal caregivers. So um, our organization provides um, support groups and education, and there are other organizations that we partner with who are also providing um, support and education, um, as well as other services such as respite care um, and other things that help to support the caregiver. Um, participating in clinical trials can also be a way to help support the caregiver. Um, there's a currently a trial happening out of the um, University of Utah about um, specifically self care for the caregiver. And so increasing awareness of these resources can really make a difference. Um, creating a dementia competent workforce, how could that help support caregivers? Um, again, creating more awareness, more training opportunities for those to understand what dementia is, what Alzheimer's is, um, what the challenges associated with that uh, entails and how we can support it. What are the resources that are available to provide support um, so that we can all make better referrals. And then expanding Alzheimer's research in Utah. Um, we are, of course, working towards a cure, um, but even the research, as I mentioned, participating in clinical trials can be something that benefits caregivers and um, moves things forward for them as well. So the Alzheimer's Association, um, we're definitely focused on um, multiple pillars. We're trying to work towards finding a cure. Um, we're trying to engage people in those efforts, increase awareness, advocate for change in policy and such, and also providing support to caregivers as well. Um, and that all, 
you know, brings together towards our vision, which is a world without Alzheimer's. Um, our tagline is the brains behind saving yours. And our mission is really just to lead the way to end Alzheimer's and all other dementia by accelerating global research, driving risk reduction and early detection and maximizing quality care and support. How do we do that? So we have uh, core services, uh, the first one being information referral. So this is something that um, you can all engage in and we can provide information to you so that you can make these information referrals as well. Um, but basically it's having a good resource list, knowing what's available in the state of Utah um, and specifically in regional areas um, to connect people with how they, you know, anything that might meet their needs, whether it's finding housing, um, they need someone to help make a diagnosis, they're looking for respite care, uh, they're looking for support, all of those things um, combined together for information referral. And we do that here. So if you, if you don't know, um, send them over to us. And if, if you want to be someone who knows, um, connect with us and we'll help to inform you so that you can make those referrals as well. Um, education, so we provide a lot of education for caregivers as well as those living with um, Alzheimer's. And I'll show you a little bit about that education towards the end of this presentation. Um, but we have a lot of curriculum based on dealing with the behaviors, uh, there's challenges dealing with the behaviors of those living with Alzheimer's, uh, how to communicate better to um, increase um, really the, the quality of life of both the caregiver and with the person living with the disease. Um, so a lot of the support is actually provided through education as well. And those sessions are great places to send people to ask questions, to find out um, how to troubleshoot problems and just really put a lot of tools in their tool belt on um, being a caregiver for someone living with Alzheimer's. Um, care consultation uh, is actually a more in-depth version of the information referral. Um, but it can be done by master's level clinicians who are trained um, on specifically Alzheimer's disease and dementia. And so the main way that we offer that is by referring people to our helpline. You should see the number there at the bottom. So I would really like to emphasize the helpline um, and especially this opportunity for a care consultation. So um, this can happen at any stage of caregiving and throughout, it's really the go-to resource for getting immediate support um, for caregivers. So uh, we we get calls when you know behavioral issues come up, um, any type of behavioral issue, any type of challenge. Where do I go for this issue? Um, here's the challenges we're facing. Um, here's what my loved one is currently going through, and they can call that 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, and speak with a master's level clinician. So it's a really incredible resource and that all of these resources are free. Um, another thing that they can get access to by calling a helpline is, is when are our educational sessions, when are our support groups happening as well. Um, and the support groups are um, definitely more intimate settings to connect with others who are currently or who have gone through um, the experience of caregiving and we also have early stage engagement. So, so basically support groups for those early with early diagnosis um, so that they can connect with others and connect with the resources um, for uh, living with, with Alzheimer's and dementia. We also have a lot online um, on our website, alz.org forward slash Utah. Uh, there's actually a lot of these resources you can access just through the, through the website. Um, our education can be provided through online recordings as well as um, uh, live sessions, virtual sessions in Zoom and um, soon to be in-person sessions. We're returning to in-person options um, coming up in June.
So there's our website again, alz.org forward slash Utah. I would encourage you to um, get familiar with that and you know, just look around and see how you can um, find the resources that I'm mentioning. You're all, of course, I'm gonna share my contact info if you wanna just reach out directly to me and I can connect you with any type of resources that you would like to share or have access to. Um, and the helpline is the easiest go-to as well. Anyone can call the helpline, not just caregivers, um, community members and partners as well. If you, if you wanna find the, the quickest um, connection to all these resources, just call our helpline. So how can you get involved? Making referrals to the helpline, again, as I mentioned, is probably the number one thing that I would recommend. Um, connecting with me and I can provide you with resources like flyers to promote our support groups and education. Um, we would love to help you support um, these efforts specifically in your area by hosting support groups at your location, um, hosting education programs at your location, not just for caregivers, but anyone in the public, uh, we want to educate. And so if you are interested in having us um, host an education program for your group, please contact me and I'll be sharing my contact info in just a moment. If you find this is something that um, you're like, this is my, uh, this is, this is me. This is something I want to connect with. I want to help uh, push these efforts forward <clears throat> in some way. We will train you. Um, you can become trained as a support group facilitator um, and help just uh, guide others who are dealing with this, the, the burden of dementia and Alzheimer's. Um, community educator, we'll train you on our curriculum and, and delivering it, and you can deliver it to your groups. Um, we have a lot of great classes. There's a variety of curriculum. And um, the last one I would recommend would be community representative, and that's more um, being able to conduct outreach and just kind of be equipped to do those information and referrals um, that I mentioned earlier. So the Alzheimer's Association um, is here to help, and there's a lot of ways that you can connect with us, as you've seen. Um, if you like the information, if you'd like more information, you're welcome to either share your contact information um, now in the uh, Q&A portion. Of, if you look over to, I think, the right side of your screen, you should be able to submit. If you want to just send me your email address, I'd be happy to follow up with you and make it easy. You won't have to think about it after you fill your brain with a ton of other info today. Um, or you're welcome to quickly send me an email and I will follow up with you there. Um, so that would probably be the quickest if, if you want more information on getting involved to follow up from this presentation, which, we're, which isn't over yet. I just wanted to share this with you now. Um, and then I'm gonna show you a video about the Helpline, so you can understand better really what happens behind the scenes when someone contacts the helpline. And then we're going to look at some of our curriculum that we offer and what that what part of a attending a community education course would look like. Um, and that helps us to understand as well um, the voice of the caregiver that they can connect with at those education sessions. Okay, so I'm gonna show you a video about our helpline right now that will hopefully help you really understand why this is so important to refer. The Alzheimer's Association for all day, every day, for people facing Alzheimer's disease through our 24 seven helpline. Whether it's basic information or crisis management, specialists and master's level clinicians offer confidential support to people living with Alzheimer's or other dementia, caregivers, families, and the public. Callers receive help in their preferred language through our bilingual staff or translation service, which accommodates more than 200 languages. 
the Alzheimer's Association has a two-fold mission. We're about people and science, advancing research, and providing care and support for everyone who's affected by Alzheimer's disease. We have information about the global resources, education programs, caregiver support groups, and programs and services for individuals with dementia. Son programas para las familias, para las personas que tienen Alzheimer's para que puedan uh, manejar los cambios. We have care consultants that offer additional counseling and guidance. Care consultation is offered for advanced support. This includes current care situations or planning for future care. Sometimes start a crisis situation. They will call us to reach out to us anytime they have questions about the disease. There are options of support groups, most importantly, in that time of need, they feel like they have other options. The association provides so much to people, but I think what we particularly provide in the contact center is an opportunity for people to talk with someone who gets what they're going through. I think that's fundamentally what's most important. Caring for somebody with Alzheimer's disease. You want to speak with somebody who understands what this experience is like and put themselves in your shoes. We're here 24-7 because it's a 24-7 disease and there's no instruction manual to care for someone who's disabled. You're trying to be the tailor of the information we're giving to a person. There's really no cookie cutter solution for a family of disabled. People often call the Alzheimer's Association or their parent for today might be the day that they get a diagnosis, or the day that a family member doesn't remember their name. And they call us, and we're able to meet them where they are and help them. Make the call. Definitely make the call. We're here when you're ready. We're here to listen, and then we're really here to want to help. No pierden nada con llamar, pero pueden llamar para nosotros. Estamos aquí para First-time callers are always surprised when they see when they call, and they never expect to get what they get when they call. We understand it's not easy to pick up a phone uh, and to reach out for help, but you're going to you speak with very competent, compassionate, and truly caring individuals uh, who want to do their best by you. There you have it. So, as you can see, um, just looking at the phone number, you probably would have got a good idea of how important um, the, this resource truly is. Uh, the people on the other end of that phone call have a lot of tools in their tool belt. Um, they will provide comfort in delivering those resources as well. And um, that resource is available to anyone who wants to call the helpline. And so I don't know um, who we have here today and what kind of role you might be in, but if you, have, if you deal with this population in any way, um, it might be good to try calling the helpline and um, just have a chat with one of the care consultants about how you can um, navigate those resources, what are the resources in your area, um, and how you can share them with others, um, as well as contacting me, and I'd be happy to explain that as well. Okay, I'm going to switch over to another presentation um, that's actually from our uh, educational programs for living with Alzheimer's. Um, this specific curriculum is usually delivered in a three-part series. Um, most of our curriculum is delivered in just one session at a time. Um, this particular one, uh, curriculum is a series, and we have this series available for um, all the stages of living with Alzheimer's, as well as we have this curriculum available for those um, living with Alzheimer's themselves. 
Um, this particular one is for caregivers of those living with Alzheimer's in the early stage. And so I'm going to skip ahead just a bit um, so that I can talk to you about um, or that so I can show you the pieces about uh, supporting um, someone living with Alzheimer's and what what caregivers are saying um, as well. And so you can see that there's four layers of a care team that play unique and significant roles in the planning and implementation of overall care. Um, a person with Alzheimer's, with dementia, and their care partner, and then there's family, friends, um, work, um, healthcare professionals, community partners, and organizations can all provide support, guidance, and assistance. Um, the important thing that I think a big takeaway that we all need to think of is that um, caregivers and the person living with Alzheimer's or dementia should not live in a vacuum. They really need a broad um, network of support and access to as many um, of the services as possible. Um, there's a lot of different it's a very complex situation. A lot of our trainings, as I mentioned, deal with all, all the different complexities because there are so many. Um, and so if someone's not connected to these, you can imagine uh, just maybe the anxiety they're experiencing is wondering like, what do I do about this problem? And, and then maybe even not even being able to have the capacity to realize all of the things that, that they, they need to think about down the road. Um, there's just a lot. And so the bigger the, the care and support network, um, the better. Um, so this is a, a quote from a care partner. She says, I need my mom to talk about what's happening to my mom. And um, this is, there's a, a lot of some, uh, sorry, <laughs> there's a lot of friends from care partners and caregivers of just the struggles that they experience as they're trying to care for their loved one. Um, and one of the things we want them to know is you're not alone. And when they connect with a support group and an education session and all the, our, our other resources, they can really feel that they're not alone. I don't know if you've ever had an experience where you've dealt with a specific issue and you find others dealing with that issue as well. And you're like, oh, okay. It feels so good to connect with someone who gets it. Um, and that's one of the greatest benefits of, of reaching out to these resources is, is finding your people and realizing you're not alone. Um, it can be a really difficult adjustment um, when you're used to being able to relate to your loved one and suddenly that relationship becomes like foreign, almost like you're speaking a different language. Um, it's very difficult to navigate. And so um, we can help them understand and normalize that and say, like, this is part of the stages of the disease. Here's why that's happening. And here's what we can equip you with to deal with those challenges. Um, so we talked about the stress on care uh, givers or care partners and how the burden is really high. And here's some of the signs of stress among care partners. So it's good to be able to recognize these and, and be able to identify them um, so that we can say, hey, I need some self-care or we need to support this person better. Um, they're dealing with a lot and they have signs of stress. Some of these are denial, anger, social withdrawal, anxiety, depression, exhaustion, sleeplessness irritability, uh, even lack of concentration or problems with their own physical health can be signs of that. Um, obviously, it's a stressful situation and signs of stress are probably, you know, unavoidable in some cases, but there's got to be support and ways of coping that increase along with that increase in stress. I'm going to show um, a video and this is uh, Beverly and she, her husband has Alzheimer's disease and she discusses how she cares for herself. I have people that I can call, whether it's my support group at church or 
of my family members. Call and talk to my sister. I can call and talk to my daughter. I can call and talk to uh, someone from the church. So that's how I how I really cope. The other way I cope is that I spend time for myself. I schedule a time for myself at least once a week where I don't have to do anything for anybody else but for Beverly. Sometimes I read. Sometimes I will watch a movie. Uh, every month, every four weeks, I go for a massage, one hour massage. No cell phone on, no phone calls, no nothing. So I get my massage twice a year. I go to a spa, and once every other year, I go on a cruise. Love it. Beverly is a really great example of a caregiver who has developed a very strong system of, of self-care. Unfortunately, this is less common um, for most caregivers, and so um, they're still in the throes of just overwhelm and dealing with all of the burden of that new stress in that relationship and um, responsibility. So every caregiving situation is different, and specific needs apply to all dementia care partners. Um, but they, they typically do put their own needs on the back burner while they're caring for their loved ones. Um, and so uh, you can see that there's some tips that we share um, and we really also help people to talk about, well, how should you, because people will say, well, this all sounds great, right? Exercising and listening to my body and, and doing my hobbies, but how am I gonna make that work? And so having someone else to talk to about that, who understands the situation and how can you really develop these habits and create a better system for practicing self-care um, is something that we can help them with. And, and also just even having these reminders and validation, like this is important, it's really important. Um, this is something that needs to take priority as well as all of the immediate needs that you're facing. Um, more more quotes shared from care partners. Um, one care partner shared, when this first happened, I thought we would never be happy again. Now I know that life is not over for us. Um, this was from a spouse whose husband has Alzheimer's disease. And her honesty really just reveals what most family members and close friends of someone with Alzheimer's disease are looking for, a way to pick up life again. Um, and we want people to know that you'll be able to do this um, there's tools and ideas in the Living with Alzheimer's um, curriculum program that we do that can help share and, and connect with others as well through the support groups, through um, our other curriculum, and contacting the, you know, the, for those care consultations. And really, it's okay to reach for the stars and think we can be happy, we can have high quality of life while dealing with this situation. So here's another last video. This is Josie, whose husband is in the early stage of Alzheimer's, and she talks about her experience. Um, I remember feeling when they were when they were saying that be sure it was all. I had the feeling that I was standing on the edge, on the rim of a huge black hole. I was going to be falling into this hole. That, that was how I visualized how I was feeling. Um, well, but I have not true. Encourage other people know that there is is life after Alzheimer's, after the diagnosis. So it's difficult to become involved in the Alzheimer's a lot of resources, a lot to give, um, reinvent your life, not have the same life that you had before. 
but you can reinvent it. And it may be richer than life that you that you already know about. So I encourage people to get involved in um, find a support group because it helps to talk to other people that are in the same Um, but um, a lot of friends will slowly drop off radar, as Ellen would say. Um, but you gain new friends. Um, life, I think, has become richer because you don't take things for granted. Right now, we're so fortunate. Ellen is, is um, still at the early stages, so I don't know what. What lies ahead? Um, like you said, it's not mapped. But for this early stage, anyway, um, life and, and involved, and there's a whole world out there that um, I don't know about you guys, but I have a hard time not getting emotional um, listening to Josie and sharing her experience. Um, Raven, this is your five minute warning. Thanks, Olivia. You're welcome. Uh, and, and then thinking about those numbers, remember how many people are going through this. And this is even just one, you know, an example of someone in the early stage, the other stages that bring their own challenges and emotions. Um, but I'm sure um, our hearts just go out and we want to do something to help. Um, we want to change the situation. Um, there's got to be more, right? It can be better. And so please contact us. Um, we can really help you. We can meet you where you're at with whatever um, you're dealing with and your situation, um, your access, whatever that may be. We have something for you that we can uh, improve um, access to support and resources and really uh, try to improve quality of life for everybody that uh, are dealing with this um, Alzheimer's or other dementias. And so, um, again, there's a helpline. Um, here's the website in general, alz.org. There's free online um, training at training.alz.org. Um, and uh, I shared my contact info with you earlier, so that's available to you as well. Feel free to reach out to me anytime. And just as we end, um, I'm going to stop sharing and just have give a few minutes in case anyone has anything that they'd like to share. Feel free to chime in um, in the chat. Um, there's one other issue that I want to bring up, and that's um, access to especially those in uh, minority groups. The risk is really high already for caregivers. Um, I think I may have mentioned, but many, many caregivers actually die before the person that they're caring for because of the burden of caregiving and the lack of self-care. Um, we also see that women are more strongly impacted and um, members of um, uh, the Latinx community and African-American communities are also higher risk. And so the more that we can make sure that these resources are available to everyone, the better. And I'm just so grateful that you, you spent time with me today. And I hope to hear from you and um, give you support in any way that I'm able. Thank you so much. Okay, and thank you so much, Raven, for um, that informative and helpful presentation. Unfortunately, we are just about out of time. Um, so we have reached the end of this session of the Utah Elder Justice Conference, and I want to thank you for attending the Support for Alzheimer's and Dementia Caregivers session. We hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you so much.